Hey, Pre-Sales Collective, it's your host, James Kakis, and today I'm going to be joined by David Marsh, Vice President of Global Sales Engineering at MRI Software. The topic of today's episode is called Continuously Improve. This is something that I think we all need to be doing. Our customers involve, our organizations involve, management styles involve, and so we as people leaders, we as solutions engineers, we as pre-sales professionals need to make sure that we're improving. We're improving our craft, we're improving our approach. In today's episode, David and I are going to get into the nitty-gritty around continuously improve and talk about ways to do that as an individual contributor as a leader, and really whose role it is within an organization. Is it the broader executive? Is it the manager? Or is it ourselves? Enjoy. Hey, David, welcome to the Pre-Sales Podcast. Thanks for having me. I am glad to have you. I appreciate all the work that you've done with Pre-Sales Collective and the events that you've been on. And I think it's just about time that we had you on the podcast. Happy to do it. I think there's a ton of great content that I've already seen on the calendar this year. Love to uh, give back to the community however I can. Appreciate that. I mean, that's really what it's all about. How's 2021 going for you so far? 2021 is crazy. Crazy in a good way, right? So everybody's in sales kickoff season, getting that messaging out, getting the sales team pumped up to do crazy amounts of new revenue. So everybody's getting that vision burned into their forehead so they can see what's coming down the pipe. And of course, thinking about all your projects for the year, what are you trying to do? Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to be looking at demo automation and some of the other cool things that are going on out there. But we're also taking a look at our fundamentals, our discovery process, our end-to-end sales motion, and how can we do all those fundamentals better? So a lot of work yeah. to do this year. I love that. And I actually, one, love that you're exploring demo automation, but two, that you're talking about fundamentals. It keys in really well with what we'll talk about in today's episode. But I do think that that's one of those things that gets overlooked. Companies and teams will move so fast and you realize, oh, we have the foundation, but you got to come back and reevaluate because sometimes it's lost touch or it's changed from its initial perspective or initial intent. Absolutely. Yeah, just like you, always working on new articles, new content, working on an ebook, trying to put some of these thoughts down. As I have these conversations with other sales engineering leaders on Pre-Sales Collective, there's just so much good stuff out there that needs to be captured and put out into the community. You're exactly right. I was going to ask you about the ebook. Tell us a little bit about that project. So the book's going to be called Strategic Sales Engineering. And I felt like there was a gap in everything that's out there. There are great training books, how to demo. There's some great books on how to be a great sales engineering manager. But really from building an organization from the ground up all the Mm -hmm. way through hyper growth, I felt like there's an opportunity there to add some value by talking about how to build and scale a high performance sales engineering team. Well, I'm excited to hear more about it and learn more about it when it comes out. But today we're going to actually talk about one of the chapters that you let me get a sneak peek of, which I'm excited to talk about. But before we get there, I have to ask, how did you get into pre-sales? Great question. Funny story. I had no idea what a sales engineer was. You know, going through college, had never heard of it. And I formed a relationship, a good friendship with my Cisco sales engineer, Mm. And he told me you could actually get paid for selling people software. And I was like, what, really? And of course, they were selling hardware too. But he convinced me that I would enjoy the role and be successful in that role. It took a little convincing, actually, because I was an IT guy at the time. And let's just say I didn't always have the best impression of my customer's appreciation of my knowledge. I tried to give it out unsolicited a lot and had very mixed results. But he taught me something, a key lesson that I retain to this day. And I tell everybody on my team when they come onto my team, I was getting really nervous when I was getting ready to do a huge demo for me at the time. And he told me, he said, David, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know more than the customer. And I took that in the best possible sense. You will always have more to learn, but you should add value to every conversation with a customer. I love that advice. That is fantastic advice. And I think if you approach every conversation like that, it will do wonders for you. I actually had a very similar conversation early on in my career when my managers pulled me aside during a break on a big meeting. He was like, hey, you know way more than these people. You should act like it. So <laughs> I love that that resonated with you because that resonated with me as well. Do you want to talk about the negative view of sales? 
So I used to have a pretty negative view of sales when I came out of college. And I had this idea in my mind, I guess, of a used car salesman. And as I learned more about the craft and I met better salespeople, I realized that you're the one that gets to choose your approach to sales. And I choose to take the approach that we're here to help people solve problems. And this really ties back into that intense focus in the industry right now on providing the best customer experiences possible. Because it's true, no one wants to be sold to or feel like they're getting sold to, but everybody wants to buy stuff. That's a very good point. And I think that's a podcast episode in itself is talking about the change in buying behavior. But I think you're right. Our pre-sales role is at the center of that. And that's why I'm really excited to talk about today's topic of continuously improve. Because it's a broad term, but what does it really mean? And what does it really mean in our profession? Let's dive in on that, David. Maybe the first question is taking a step back. Why should anybody care about continuous improvement? So there will always be competition for the best roles at the best companies. And it doesn't really matter what you decide that you want is really what's important. And the way to put yourself in the best position for those types of opportunities in your life is to continuously improve your skill set because that's how you increase your value to the market. Your success in everything, whether it's your personal life or your professional life, is driven by what you choose to do on a daily basis. So to me, continuous improvement is directly tied together to the concept of your daily habits. I'm a big believer in the concept of having daily rituals or habits that drive you in the direction of what you want to achieve. Goals are great, but connecting your goals to your daily habits is how you unlock that continuous improvement. And along those lines, I'm a big reader. I'm always throwing stuff out in my blog articles or anything that I post. I highly recommend a couple of books on this theme of the daily habits, and that's Atomic Habits by James Clear and The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Great recommendations. We're going to have to check those books out for sure. Uh, We'll make sure that they're highlighted. Tell me a little bit more about what some of your daily habits and routines are. So there are four daily rituals or four daily habits that I go through and I combine both my personal and professional habits into those. So it's my morning ritual. I have a daily workday startup ritual. I have a daily workday shutdown ritual. And then I have an evening ritual. And those four groups of habits is where I get a lot of my most productive things done. So whether that's getting up and working out in the morning, having a good breakfast, couple of cups of coffee to get me ready to go. And then looking at what are the high value things I have to do today as a sales engineering leader. That's really where I get a lot of consistent mileage and distance towards the goals that I'm trying to achieve in those set aside times to get things done. I love that you have so much structure in your approach. I mean, I'm sure it allows you to be more productive. What kind of advice do you have for people who want to take that step, but are struggling to build that consistency and create that habit that allows them to be potentially more efficient with their day? You know, I would say start small. Some people get overwhelmed when they see a system like that and they're like, wow, you know, four times a day, man, that's a lot. I start small, right? Start every morning. I've even been working with my kids on this every day. Get a post-it note and write down your three most important things for the day. And that may change Mm -hmm. day to day, right? Mm -hmm. But figure out what's important. Do you have to get ready for a sales kickoff presentation? Do you need to do a dry run on that stuff? Write those three things down every day. And if you get those done, then you can move on to other stuff. But give yourself that sense of achievement every single day. I love that. So are you a big checklist guy? Do you have the checklist and get the satisfaction of checking off the box? I do, but I'm not a slave to my checklist. I think checklists are super helpful, but that's why I make the distinction that you have to be flexible and you have to be able to change what's important for you that day and be able to flex and pivot if something's going on in the business, right? If you've got a huge series of demos for a key client going on and something went badly and you need to get together with the demo services team and change the data set or something, that's going to be the big thing for the day. And you need that flexibility to feel like you're not locked into a checklist system. I like that a lot. I'm probably one of those people that is slaves to my checklist. So I love that you said that, David. I want to take a step forward on this idea of continuous improvements and bring up something that I think that I've seen in my career and I'd love your perspective on. 
What do you say to the people out there who feel like they've already mastered a specific skill or who say, hey, I've been doing this for X amount of years. I know what I'm doing. What are your thoughts when you hear something like that? So you're going to laugh, but I believe that mastery is a journey and not a destination. I swear I didn't get that out of a fortune cookie. I really do believe that to be a (laughs) fundamental truth. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. If you look at people in other fields like martial arts masters, they don't quit when they get to a certain belt rank. They Mm -hmm. keep practicing that art every day of their life because they love it. So I think you really need to step back if you feel like you've mastered a product or a solution And you need to look at that and say, if you're the best in your company or you're best in the industry or the world, what's your next move? Understand where you want to go and what skills you need to get there and work on those skills. I'm reading a great book right now called Your Next Five Moves, and that's a core theme. You need to be developing the skills today that you're going to need for your next move. And to your point, not everybody wants to be a manager, Cisco Systems. They created special positions just for people that want to get more technical. You've got distinguished Mm -hmm. engineers Mm -hmm. and all that. You can continue to be thought leader in your field. Go to conferences, speak at conferences, learn how it's going to interact with the technologies coming down the pipe. Do you fully understand what your company is doing? If you sell software as a service, do you fully understand how your company is using artificial intelligence and machine learning? What is that sweet spot? And look at things that are happening in the industry and trends that are happening and make sure that your mastery is evolving to keep pace with that change. David, I love what you're saying on this. And it's bringing up a lot of questions in my head. So is there a correlation between self-awareness and continuous improvement? Absolutely. I think that is actually one of the things that I recommend to anyone that is considering going on this path of continuous improvement. If you don't have time to reflect and review where you're at and are you getting the results you want, then how are you going to continuously improve? For me, when I come in to a new organization, whether they have a lot of processes and procedures or they need everything from the ground up, you have to figure out where you're at. You have to build a baseline. And that's the first step in being data-driven is figuring out what are you doing today? How many demos are you doing? What's your win rate? What can you do to make that win rate go higher? As you've talked about that specifically, the demo rates and the win rates, what does continuous improvement mean in the context of sales engineering? So continuous improvement means to me that, number one, you have a system for baselining the level of your skills on your team. You have a way to improve those skills on an ongoing basis, and you can identify new ways to improve those skills. So we encapsulate those concepts in my company, what we call our SE University. And this is a way that we have to continuously learn what we need to, whether that's ramping up new SEs or cross-training existing SEs, but we've got a body of knowledge for every solution. And it's not just what is it, right? It's not product knowledge. It's what SEs need. So how do you sell and position that information? We also have an online tool called SkillsBase. And that keeps track of every product that we sell and gives everybody not only a skill rating, but a passion rating. So you may be an expert in this technology, but if you can't stand selling it, it's not going to come through well. So we actually track both skills and the will to deliver that. And we keep track of this on an ongoing basis. So we know what skills we have on the team and where we need to cross train people. That's good that you guys are doing that. I don't know how many organizations doing that. And that brings me to a question that, I am fundamentally not sure of. Within an organization, whose role is it to create a culture of improvement? Is it the executive and the broader org generally? Is it a frontline manager or is it on the individual at the end of the day? So this is a tough one. I do believe it begins at the top because culture must be visible from the top down. If you get into a situation where you're leading a sales engineering team and your company might not have that structure. They're developing that culture. That doesn't mean that you can't personally lead by example in your organization, even if the exec team is struggling. But culture has to be visible as what you do every day. And this goes back to another one of my favorite books right now by Ben Horowitz, What You Do Is Who You Are, because your culture determines what you do on a daily basis. 
Do you help out your team? Even though you're busy, you've got multiple demos in a day, somebody needs you to help out with an RFP. Are you stepping up and saying, yeah, you know, I'll help you out. I'll get you over this hump because that's who we are as a team. Or are you just going to hold up your hand and say, sorry, man, I'm slammed. Can't do it. You bring up a good point around organization and managers. Like for instance, recently I've really been focusing on creating a culture of feedback, which I didn't think that existed in the broader organization. And it's what I've always operated by and felt like that's how we move the needle forward. That's how our team gets better is having the feedback. And I'm a big fan of essentially calling out what's not working. And maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I was pretty defensive about that. But now I feel like that's the only way I really move the needle and and progress. And so I like that you say it's the organization's perspective. So big leaders out there or individuals who have massive teams Like it does start with them and you and and cascades down. And obviously there's a little bit of accountability that has to exist at each level, but you're right. It does start at the top and it starts with a broader organization to make that as part of the values of the operating unit per se. Well, James, I think you identified what's probably the most important part of the system. So when I think about continuous improvement, I think about having a learning organization and having that SE university. But the most important part of that system is the feedback loops. And to your point, understanding, did we win that deal because of A, B, or C, or why did we lose that deal? If you're not having that feedback and review period, you're not learning from your mistakes. You can say you like to learn from your mistakes all you want, but if you're not having that feedback loop, it's not happening. And there's an amazing resistance, even at some of the the largest corporations, to take the time to do that. But that's where all the learning happens, to your point. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there is such a resistance? I think that A lot of salespeople like to tell themselves that they're so super busy and they don't have time for this and, you know, they need to be prospecting. But you and I both know that your best customers, your existing customers, number one, and if you're not keeping them happy, they're not going to stay your customers. And beyond that, having quality deal cycles, you're better off running a quality sales motion and having all those touch points and having that feedback to improve your sales motion than you are going out and chasing everything with a pulse. Mm -hmm. I think it's quality over quantity. You definitely need enough quantity. You need three, five X in your pipeline, you know, whatever it is for your industry, but those need to be quality at bats. And if you're not learning from every single one, then you're not taking the lessons that you need to learn into that next sales motion. So well said. And I love that you talked about your best customers or your current ones, because I think that has been a philosophy that has changed with software and SaaS, and especially in the last 10 years, because it used to kind of be that sell it and forget it type model. And that doesn't work anymore. You know, that really doesn't work. And I think that's why the prominence of orgs like customer success have really played a factor with the SaaS offerings that exist today. David, let me ask you another question that's fairly pointed about sales engineering leaders and pre-sales leaders, should they be focusing on continuous improvement or is their job just to focus on their team's continuous improvement? Well, I know a lot of people are going to laugh when they hear me say that you have to do it all, but you really do have to do it all, right? You have to make sure you're doing the talent planning. You're looking at what kind of coverage you're going to need. You're going to have to be doing all the business cases. You're going to have to be responsible for the tooling, but absolutely. And this goes back to modeling and leading by example. I believe everyone should be continuously improving. There's another guy that I read a lot of his blogs called Benjamin Hardy. And he was talking about who, not how, how to execute better with other people. And you start to realize that comparing yourself to other people is a losing game. You need to be comparing yourself to where you started from and what is your growth rate because that's all you can control. You can't control how much those other people are growing, how hard they're grinding every day, but you can go back to your daily habits and say, you know what, I need to spend 15 minutes a day reading the product docs on our new product so that I know every question somebody asked me, or at least I understand that solution better than anybody else on the team. I'm going to ask everybody listening to go listen to your answer there again. That was so well said because so many people do compare themselves to others. And there's another podcast with Pre-Sales Collective and Rob Falcone that we talk about career comparisons and it's not the right way to look at things. So I'm glad that you said that. And so maybe let's get a little tactical because 
I want to get tactical for SE leaders and for actual SEs. You talked about leaders needing to do everything. So what should SE leaders be doing to focus on the continuous improvement of themselves? I think there's three things that I certainly look to do in every new role that I come into. And again, I'm always checking to see, am I hitting the mark here? Do I need to do something differently? But number one, I think you have to be data-driven. In today's culture, I think it's really bad if your CRO or CSO asks you a question about the business and you just have no idea, right? Or you're like, "Ah, I'll go talk to sales ops and I'll get back to you in a week. That's not really where you want to be these days. So you need to be data-driven. You need to be capturing that data so that you have the answers to the questions. Number two, you need to invest in your tooling and processes so that you can capture that data, that you need to create those baselines and identify areas where you can have the most impact on the business. And then three, I would say you need to set SMART goals as a team to improve specific areas. So SMART is just an acronym for goal setting. You can Google it. There's tons of information out there, but you got to be very specific on what you're trying to achieve. And this goes back to that larger idea of a learning organization and SE University and having things that you're trying to do specifically as testing new business ideas. If your discoveries are not going as well as you think they should be, can you ask a different question and get to the information you need as a sales engineer faster? And the only way you figure that out is if you test out different questions from time to time. Once a quarter, add a different question to your discovery checklist and see if it gets you the information faster or gets you better quality information. I like that because it's all about making it part of the DNA. There's so many projects that companies go through and I feel like sales engineers and pre-sales teams are always the one innovating. But how do you make that part of your DNA? Testing, finding out if it works. If it doesn't work, move on try the next thing, but making part of your DNA. And so taking that perspective, like what advice do you have for SEs that, you know, want to continuously improve? How do those two things play together? This is a topic near and dear to my heart because obviously every performance cycle or hopefully most people are continuously coaching now these days Mm -hmm. to give that ongoing feedback to your point. But I think there's three key things that SEs can do immediately. Number one is knowing your numbers. You should always know as a sales engineer, how many demos are you doing? How many demos did you do this year? What is your win rate? And how much revenue are you influencing or touching for the business? If you want to make a case for a promotion, you're going to need to know stuff like that. So everybody needs to think about that. Number two, be a giver. So... Adam Grant has a book, Give and Take. He makes a super compelling case for the benefits of being giving towards other people. And a specific example would be joining the PSC community and being active in the Slack chat channels. Share your knowledge and experience with those new to the role or new to leadership, because that's a great way to give back and build your network. And then three, again, review your results weekly and figure out, are you getting the results that you want? There's really only four things we can do to change course when something's not working the way we want. We can start doing something new. We can stop doing something that we're already doing. We can do more of something we're already doing or do less of something we're already doing. You know, an example of that would be maybe you're constantly frustrated because you don't feel like you're getting all the information you need to do a good demo. So there's a couple of things you could do there. You could say, okay, I'm going to talk to my manager. I'm going to make sure that we have better discovery checklists or discovery notes. But you personally can go to all the salespeople you work with and say, hey, I want to have a prep call to talk about the demo flow before we do any demos because it is going to help you understand what you need to say better. It'll help me understand the demo flow I need to put out there. And together, we're going to win more. You're going to sell more. And we're all going to get paid more. That is great feedback, David. And you know, I like what you said about number two, about being a giver. Because I think this is where Kelly Pirsky on the podcast a couple of times have said, you can always give some sort of perspective. And some of the concepts we've been talking about with the Pre-Sales Leadership Collective too, is the idea of reverse mentoring. Paul Baptist said this on the first podcast that we ran in 2021 was he found a mentor that was a millennial because in his org, he wanted to learn their perspectives. And so anyone out there who might have done the role for quite some time, take that number two, be a giver, because I think it will move the needle forward and really help you and help anybody, no matter how long you've been 
an IC or a leader, there's always something new that we need to learn. And David, you've acknowledged that a lot, which I appreciate. As we get to the end of the podcast, I want to continue to make this actionable. So there are a lot of people out there who, to my point earlier about the culture of feedback, it just doesn't exist. And they're probably struggling where they should be focusing some of their improvement efforts. And so what kind of advice do you have for those people that are in that situation? I think it goes back to getting clarity. So step one is always get clear, whether that's the company vision or the team vision or your individual vision, right? You need to be able to answer the question for yourself. What is your next move? Are you trying to become the team lead for the hot new product that your company just acquired? Are you trying to make a move into management? It all depends on where you specifically want to go and what kind of skills you're going to need to get there. And I love that repeated feedback theme that we've been talking about because a lot of times that's where I figure out when somebody tells me, hey, look, David, I want to be the team lead for this product. And then those feedback sessions is where I figure out, are they really tracking in the right direction? Because a lot of times they'll come back and say, well, you know, that demo, I thought it went great. And, you know, I was really mad because the sales guy didn't prep me well enough for it. And I said, okay, well, number one, if you want to be a team leader or a manager, you need to stop thinking about just your perspective and you need to think about Mm -hmm. how is this going to impact the team? Thinking about your next step, what you want to do and how it impacts other people, because it may have been a terrible week for the sales rep and they may be completely willing to meet with you in advance and do demo preps but you've never asked them. So you're taking it personally. You're bad-mouthing them and bad-mouthing them to other sales engineers. And that's a relationship you may need. They may get promoted to sales director and you may need to work very closely with that person. So Mm -hmm. you need effective working relationships and you can't take that stuff personally. You got to go to them and say, hey, look, I want to win more and I want to win more together with you. So how can we do that? I think we can win more if we had better prep meetings. What do you think about that? But just sitting back and saying, you know, that guy doesn't care. He's just mailing it in and he's not giving me what I need. And I'm just going to complain to my manager. That's not the way to continuously improve and get to that next move. You're exactly right. David, I've really appreciated having you on the podcast. I'm looking forward to seeing the ebook and the book when it actually comes out. And I love this topic. This topic is something that I think we as a profession need to continue to embrace and become more self-aware on so that we can continue to elevate our role, our function, and really at the end of the day, uh, organizations and the impact it makes on customers. So really thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, James. I really appreciate the opportunity and love the conversation. Me too. We'll see you next time. Thank you. All right, Pre-Sales Collective, what an episode. David Marsh came prepared. I don't know about you, but I got a list of a couple different books, articles, and have some reading and educating to do. I really love David's approach to just life. He had told me that the Atomic Habits book by James Clear was a life changer for him and something that he has all of his leaders do about creating those daily habits that allow you to be successful and, and focus on the high priority items. One of the things that David said as well is mastery is a journey, not a destination. And he joked about it not coming out of a fortune cookie, but he really does believe in that. And that is very true. I mean, how many times have we responded to something saying, well, I know how to do that. I've been doing this for X many years. That might be true. But as we said in the opening, there are so many things that are evolving and changing at a very fast pace. We have to adapt. We have to evolve and we have to continuously improve. And that happens at the individual level, the manager level, the executive manager level, and the organizational level. And so if you're at a point where you can influence the culture of an organization, take it upon yourself to help your organization. Take it upon yourself to figure out how you create a culture of continuous improvement. And if you need to do a bottom-up approach as an individual contributor or frontline manager, do that as well. One of the things that really, really resonated with me is when David talked about how Benjamin Hardy in a book called Who Not How talks about stop comparing yourself to others because it's a losing game. Focus on your growth from where you started to where you're at and to where you want to go. And that journey is what this whole thing's about. And then for advice for those that are struggling, understand what's your next move. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to master? What are you trying to accomplish? Because continuous improvement and self-awareness will help you get there. 
All right, Pre-Sales Collective, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'm going to ask that you like, share, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. As always, I will see you next week.